Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we are picking up our series on the cessationist documentary. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a show where we tackle history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. My name is Joshua Lewis. I'm the pastor of King's Fellowship in Ada, Oklahoma, together with my friends Michael Miller at Reclamation Church Denver and Michael Roundtree at Bridgeway Church OKC. We set aside time every week to discuss the gifts of the Spirit. Things like, how should we pray for the sick? And how do we interpret tongues? And should we believe all the prophetic words for the new year? If you're looking for a charismatic podcast with practitioners who are actually doing the stuff, this is the show for you. Guys, we're very excited about today's program. We are picking up uh, where we left off in our last series on the Cessatious documentary. If you're out there and you're like, hey, I haven't seen the other two videos that you filmed on this episode, you don't have to go back and watch them. Each one of these videos is a standalone uh, piece of content where we're just responding to specific arguments. Uh, today, we're gonna be going through clips nine, 10, and 11, maybe, the Lord willing, we'll do clip 12. Michael Miller uh, is out and about. He'll be in the call in the next 15 minutes. Uh, but I have my co-host, Michael Roundtree, with me today. Michael, are you excited about this program? And what things do we need to say on the front end of responding to the cessationist documentary? Oh, just the same things we always say. We love cessationists. There are brothers and sisters in Jesus. And uh, we are excited to worship alongside you for all eternity. And we think you're wrong on this point. We would like to challenge and push back. That doesn't make us better. We're not better. Uh, we just uh, we just want to lovingly challenge you on this, just as you've uh, tried to challenge us. So that's what brothers do. So that's all. Yeah, so in this video, the plan is to go through clip 9, 10, and 11 for sure, maybe 12 if we have time. Uh, clip 9, we're going to be talking about the Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 2 through 4. Uh, in clip, uh, oh, I'm trying to do this up from memory. In clip 10, we're going to be doing the, oh, a wicked generation that seeks for a sign. And then in clip 11, we're going to be tackling church some church history quotes, which will... Uh, Yes, it will be very interesting. Anyway, you guys, uh, let's start off with this first clip, unless there's something else we need to say, Michael? No? No. No, okay, you're good. You're good. If we get to clip 12, Then you 12, see the next a... generation. It becomes churches like ours, where there aren't apostles, but they're looking back on that time. The writer of Hebrews, writing just before the destruction of the temple, he says, the Lord spoke this gospel. It was confirmed to us by those who heard, meaning the apostles, and the apostles were allowed to work signs and miracles to confirm that message. And so even the writer of Hebrews, writing under the auspices of the apostles, he says, I'm not working miracles. That's not happening now. The uh, uh, teacher, Tom Pennington from Countryside Bible Church uh, is saying that in the days that the book of Hebrews was being written, uh, in that very day uh, that he's he's writing these words, these miracles had come out of like out of out of circulation. They're no longer being used. They're no longer being exercised. Uh, on the top of it, it would be interesting to mention to our audience uh, that throughout this cessationist documentary, we have been given different timestamps for when the gifts of the Spirit are supposed to cease. Uh, some will say it's around the year 100 A.D. Uh, others will say it's the closing of the canon. I've got specific quotes here. Phil Johnson says uh, specifically that the gifts of the Spirit uh, were dying out in the days of the apostles. We watched that video last week. Um, we see around the year 100 is given by uh, John Boyce. Uh, 400 uh, de facto position of the early church was a sanctionist by the year 400. So multiple times we've gotten different timestamps uh, about the ending of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, apparently Tom believes uh, that even before the apostles had died, uh, even when the book of Hebrews is being written, probably before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the apostles are still alive. He, he believes that the gifts of the Spirit had ceased already by this point uh, because of this quotation that takes place here in Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, the arguments that we're going to do in response um, are not necessarily our own. We will incorporate some of our own in here. Uh, but Sam Storms has done a fantastic job of tackling this very argument uh, in Understanding Spiritual Gifts, a comprehensive guide. Uh, and he tackles, you can literally just pick up the book if you have it on uh, Scribed or on Kindle and just type in Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, it will bring up this sevenfold argument and then we'll have our own uh, content within that as well. Uh, Roundtree, you, where, where do you want to start with this uh, uh, with this argument? Oh, maybe we could do a little rotation, kind of walk through. And I don't think you can get better than this argumentation from Sam Storms. He lists uh, seven arguments in response to Hebrews chapter two uh, and using that as a cessationist argument. Of course, the cessationist wants to say that, 
hey, just Hebrews 2, it says that the signs and wonders, the miracles were given to the apostles in order to attest to their uh, apostleship and message. And uh, and so now that foundational period is over. I mean, that's a paraphrase, I think, of what uh, Tom Pennington just said. And so we could just walk through a few arguments, seven to be exact. And it's God's number, so it must be right, Josh. Um, so condensed sevenfold argument against Hebrews 2. So um, so here's what Sam first says. First of all, there are multiple purposes for miracles. And, uh, and so it's not just attestation. It's not just to attest to, hey, these apostles, they're trustworthy teachers of doctrine, nor is it even just to attest to the gospel itself. Miracles definitely do do that. That is one of their purposes. And that's the, even if that is one of the purposes, that doesn't mean that that purpose ended. Why wouldn't God want to continue testifying to the reality of the gospel? But even so, it also ignores the other reasons for why spiritual gifts are given. Uh, spiritual gifts are given uh, for love, Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, and building up the church. That's Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, spiritual gifts are given to glorify Jesus. They make much of him. Uh, spiritual gifts and, and miracles and healing, like all of the, quote, signs and wonders. Uh, there's like, Josh, how many of these have we listed? Like seven, eight, nine, ten reasons? What, what am I missing here? I mean, there, there, there are so many reasons that the gifts are given. Show compassion. Obviously given, yeah, for compassion, they show the God's heart for people, uh, it displays God's glory. Uh, was this, you know, uh, the, because of this man's sin or his parents' sin? It wasn't. It was for God to be oh, glorified God. and magnified in the earth. Uh, it's to display that he has power over the devil. I mean, over and over and over again, there are a multitude of reasons that we've given in prior videos. And it's just worthy of re-mentioning here in this video that the gifts of the Spirit have been given by God for a plurality of reasons. You can't just say it was only to attest to signs, wonders, and miracles. Um, that, that, am, I, am I picking up what you're laying down, Michael? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the, the point being, like, we can't pick Hebrews 2 and say, oh, look, it says God gave uh, signs and wonders by gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, it, that, he, that he did this to bear witness, and that's the only reason, and therefore it's gone. Hey, it was just a foundational period. Because we have so many other passages saying that other that it's for other purposes too, and if those purposes continue, then it follows that the spiritual gifts, the so-called sign gifts, also continue because those purposes are still valid. The cessationist is saying, like, hey, it's no longer valid because the gospel's already been testified to. Now we have it codified. In the scripture, we don't need the signs and wonders anymore. Uh, but do we need God's compassion anymore? Do we still need love anymore? Do we still need the church to be edified, to be built up? I would say we need all of these reasons. Do we still need to glorify God, which healing miracles, so-called sign gifts, do? The answer is we need all of those things. And so to use Hebrews 2 in this way unnecessarily narrows the scope to what the purpose of these are. Hebrews 2 mentions one of those purposes, one of many. And even if cessationists were right, even if that was the only purpose for signs and wonders, what uh, was to attest to the apostles and their message of the gospel, um, that, that even if it was just that, don't we still want signs and wonders to point to the reality of the gospel? Um, I've read anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of Muslims who come to Christ around the world are coming because they've had a dream or a vision about Jesus. I think that's a good thing. I actually know of a cessationist who's convinced somebody who was an unbel uh, unbeliever and got saved through a dream that the devil gave them that dream and that person became a cessationist. I, I'm like, we got to go to extremes to reach this point. So where I'm driving this is we still need these things because we still want to testify to the gospel and to the glory of Jesus. We want to still show love and edify and all of those things. So that's just okay. one of seven arguments. Yeah. So Josh, one of the next one. Yeah, one of seven, 
these gifts, uh, you're, you're viewing it reductionistically. My, my argument is also that it's reductionistically, uh, but it's not reductionistically just to uh, th these gifts are only for uh, the, the foundation of the message of the gospel. Once that message has been passed on, once we know that it is the message now, no longer gifts. But 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 there's an argument made by Tom to suggest that these uh, attestations, these proofs, these, these individuals who are bearing witness to the proof of this message, that those individuals were only apostles. I want to I read his quote right up here. It says, the writer of Hebrews is writing just uh, just before he says, the Lord spoke uh, this gospel. It was confirmed to us by those who heard, meaning the apostles. And the apostles were allowed to work signs uh, and miracles to confirm the message. D does this actually say, uh, does this passage in Hebrews say that only apostles worked signs, wonders, and miracles, and only they were the ones that were allowed to pass on this message? We've gone over this already uh, as Jesus sends out not just the 12, he sends out the 72, and with the Great Commission, tells his disciples to spread this gospel message and follow the pattern of those who are doing it. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. It would be the expected pattern that we would follow in the demonstration of those signs wonders and miracles, just like the apostles. As, as uh, Peter tells us on the day of Pentecost, the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 is going to be poured out on all sons and daughters, male, female, young, old, prophecy, dreams, visions. This revelation is not just for that generation, but for all generations and all who are far off who would believe. It's a promise given to all of the church. And as we read throughout the, church, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, he gives supernatural gifts to the body to build them up. But also, as we see in 1 Corinthians 14, the unbelief falls on their face and declares, surely God is among you. If these gifts are done in a decent and an orderly way, it brings people unto salvation. So here uh, you are actually, again, reductionistically saying, well, it's a, it's about the, the gifts affirming the message. And, and the only people who are doing the gifts are the apostles. In fact, this verse says nothing about the apostles. This passage doesn't limit the reference to the apostles. Uh, and many beyond the 12 heard Jesus and saw his miracles. Again, the 72 would be a great example of those who were sent out by Jesus, who performed miracles, who proclaimed the gospel message, and, and would not have been considered apostles. Many beyond the 12 also experienced uh, and exercised these spiritual gifts, like in the Church of Corinth, the Church of Galatia, uh, uh, Thessalonica, Romans, which we know that Paul didn't attend. Uh, he, he longed to go to them to impart to them some spiritual gift, but he teaches them and instructs them on spiritual gifts. In 1 Thessalonians, tells them not to despise prophecy, but to cling to what is good, not to reject what is evil. We're told that not to forbid speaking in tongues. So over and over again, the global church, not just the apostles, but the church uh, of Jesus Christ in the first century was practicing spiritual gifts. Uh, and to suggest that in Hebrews chapter two, uh, that this gift somehow uh, was only about the message and that this that these gifts and, and, and the activities here is only about the apostles, again, is a reductionistic reading of that text. So that's point number one and point number two. You, Michael, pick up with point number three. Yeah, sure. Uh, point number three, it comes down to where the text speaks about bearing witness, and it's unclear precisely what he's talking about these miracles bearing witness to. Let me reread the text. It says, uh, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, uh, and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs, wonders, and uh, and various miracles. Um, okay, so precisely what is he talking about bearing witness to? According to MacArthur, uh, John MacArthur says uh, that the past uh, that the past tense of it was attested is a clear biblical word that miracles, wonders, signs, gifts were given only to the first generation of apostles uh, to confirm that they were messengers of new revelation. Uh, but what we find here in this unclear target is that when it says that God bore witness, uh, it's unclear what to it means. Is it, is this, uh, what precisely is it to? And I would argue, and this is Sam's argument, that it's to the great salvation. Uh, how should we neglect if we neglect so, such a great salvation? And if God bore witness to the greatness of salvation, then why would he not continue to bear witness to his great salvation today? It's unnecessary to limit what God is bearing witness to, to specifically the apostles in their sharing of the message. And so, uh, it, and so I would say it's, it's attesting to the glorious and great salvation uh, that Jesus offers, and that's still worth bearing witness to. Josh, that's good. Would you 
fill in That's any good. gaps I'll there. actually pick up on that tense of bore witness because you, you talked about what exactly the target is. What are you bearing witness unto? Uh, you're saying it's the great salvation, not necessarily the message in and it of itself. I want to pick up on the past tense here of bore witness because in English, it's rendered bore witness in our English translations. However, the Greek participle, particip- blah, 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 participle, that's such a fun word to say on air, uh, bore witness is a present tense, suggesting that even uh, during the time of the apostles, that this these gifts, these supernatural activities are actually taking place in the days uh, that Hebrews is being written. It's actually written in the present tense, not the past tense. So um, uh, the argument that's been writ, uh, put together by Tom here is saying, well, well, the author of Hebrews, whoever they may be, they're saying that, that God at one time, he bore witness in days past to something, you know, to to the the gospel message, and now we no longer need it. And even in his day, it was passing away. However, it's not a past tense participle. It's a present tense. It's actually still happening in the church uh, uh, that that's taking place in the the area and region in which the book of Hebrews is being spread abroad. In fact, even cessationist scholars will take this phrase and say, you know, this looks like it's still happening uh, wherever the, the letter of Hebrews is circulating. This event is still taking place. If I take um, uh, William Lane here, he says our author's uh, language suggests that the uh, co- cooperative evidence was not confirmed to the initial act of preaching, but continued to be displayed within the life of the community. Tom Schreiner also acknowledges this possibility when he says, perhaps the miracles described here were ongoing in the life of the readers to the book of Hebrews. So uh, as we're walking through these arguments, picking up number one, uh, there's multiple reasons for miracles. So the idea uh, that, okay, now that the message has been given, it's rejectionistic and we don't need miracles anymore. That's a, that's a silly reason. Uh, number two, uh, it's not specifically to apostles. Nowhere in this list does it say it's specific to apostles. It just says whatever is being attested to uh, is being attested to by signs, wonders, and miracles. The target of what is being attested to is actually unclear. It certainly could potentially be uh, the, the gospel message that's going forward, but it is actually more likely probably the great salvation that is being attested to. Point number four that I just picked up was what is it bearing witness that bear witness is not a past tense bear witness, but a present tense bore witness. So even as the author of Hebrews is writing this book, it appears that these supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles are actually taking place in their very day. So I would I would encourage again my cessationist brothers to reconsider the way that they're looking at Hebrews chapter two, two through four, uh, because I just I don't think this is a good use of exegesis. It's a reductionistic argument where you're kind of you're you're, you're taking what the text says and making it say a bunch of things that the text in, yeah. in its original audience would not quite have understood. I'm gonna toss it over to yeah. Michael Miller to make our fifth point on the issue. Oh, there's Michael Miller. Yeah. Hey, Miller, before, hey, welcome. Uh, Thank Miller. you. It's good good to have you. Uh, mm-hmm. But I want to tag what Josh was just saying for just a moment on the past versus present tense of bore witness or bear bearing witness. Um, if it's present tense and you were, the, you were mentioning the participle, an ING word. Okay, so here's why that uh, I want to just kind of add on that. One reason that matters is it actually backfires the continuationist argument because they need it to be past tense and they need it to be past tense so that they can make miracles, signs and wonders past tense. Oh, this was just part of that foundational stage. But if it is ongoing tense, it would suggest that the gifts actually are ongoing. And uh, and so that would be one thing. The other thing, whenever I hear somebody say, well, what the word really means uh, is this or that, I always want to look at what are the major reputable translations saying on this? Because if those major reputable translations are all rendering it the exact same way, uh, just because a word can mean something doesn't mean that that actually is what it means in, in context. So the, the guys who are like really, really good at this and a team of scholars working together, what are they saying? And on this point, it actually goes both ways. I only say that so that you know, like this is a very legitimate point to make. Uh, the New King James Version, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, present tense, a participle. Um, NIV does past tense, testified. Um, ESV does past tense. Um, and CSB does past tense. But the NASB does present tense, participle. God also testifying with them. And 
uh, and there are more I could keep So reading. it's the word for word translations that are getting the ing the, the right participle in whereas uh, the, yeah, the, the dynamic equivalents the ES... are kind of massaging it. Well, ESV could be called a word for word, I would say, but the NASB probably more than any other and uh, the the most word for word cuz ESV I think is probably a little more readable than the NASB and uh, either way, but NASB super reputable and a word for word translation to your point, Josh. Fantastic. So Miller, Miller, pick us up point number 5. Point number 5, no prohibition of continued miracles. That's the one. You're but muted. You're going to have to take your mute off. A rookie mistake right there. Yeah. Uh yeah, I know. Yes. So there is no prohibition that miracles will continue in this passage. You won't find it there. The passage doesn't suggest that God cannot or will not continue confirming the gospel through supernatural displays of power. Um, here's what Sam Storms has to say about this in Understanding Spiritual Gift. He says, there is nothing in the passage that suggests God cannot, does not, or will not continue to attest and confirm the truth of the gospel through the supernatural spiritual displays of power. Some argue that since we have the Bible, we no longer need such miracles or spiritual gifts to confirm the truth of the gospel. But the Bible itself nowhere says that, and it doesn't say it here. Um, I lost my place. Uh, okay, uh, nowhere in Scripture are we told that the Bible replaces miracles or that the gospel cannot still be confirmed by supernatural displays of power. If supernatural displays of power and the operation of spiritual gifts confirmed the truth of the gospel of salvation in the first century— why could they not continue to do so Amen today? What I what I find interesting about this is you see this all the time. Whenever somebody creates some sort of error in their exegesis or in their doctrine, usually the very passages that they're using to uh, create that doctrine oftentimes prove the opposite when you understand the passage. And in this case, you also have to say that the author's intent in this passage was to teach cessationism, which I don't think any of these people would say, no, no, the, the author's intent is to teach cessationism right here. No, no, no. There's no way you could find that in this passage. Um, one, because the Bible doesn't claim that the miracles themselves replace or are, are replaced by scripture. It's just not in there. It's saying that these miraculous works, oh, and by the way, gifts of the spirit are meant to confirm salvation. Uh, or the gospel of salvation. So I, what it's meant to confirm is not necessarily the Bible itself, but rather the gospel of salvation. Roundtree, you want to take us home with the last two? Sure. Uh, I would say that spiritual gifts serve a common good. That was number six, but we ended up kind of hitting on that in number one or two there. Uh, and then the, just the the fact that, uh, and Sam brings this up in the original Greek, there's, uh, there's no... Uh, there's no reference to the Greek word for spiritual gifts that we find elsewhere in Scripture, like Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, etc., uh, that, the, that the text may refer to, uh, quote, distributions of the Holy Spirit, which could imply a broader range of gifts. Uh, in which case, if we want to take the cessationist line of reasoning, that this broader range, not just the, quote, sign gifts, but uh, like... It, if we want to, if if that is the author's intent, that he really intended more than quote unquote sign gifts, but rather a distribution of gifts, uh, which actually a pretty strong case could be made for that because he includes miracles beside that, as though miracles was distinct from these other gifts or distributions of the spirit. Then it would seem like to follow the cessationist argument, we would have to say more than just the quote unquote sign gifts ceased, but we would have to say that like teaching ceased and. Uh, serving ceased and generosity, ceased. like these other spiritual gifts, the gift of giving, the gift of administration, and certainly no cessationist will say that. We're just saying that if they want to be consistent, uh, given the breadth of this potent, uh, of this Greek word and that it's not limited uh, to the charismata, that it's not limited to, uh, or that it's not limited to what I meant to say was to the sign gifts, uh, would suggest that a wider scope of spiritual gifts are uh, are implied, and uh, and I would add one more. I I know I'm adding to Sam's argumentation here. So Sam, you're awesome. Seven was a good number to stop on. It's God's number, but I'm going to go ahead and add an eighth. Um, <laughs> and it comes back to the the flow of Hebrews chapter two. In Hebrews chapter two, 
he first he, he compares the law with the gospel and the law was given he says through angels and the gospel was given and accompanied by these signs and uh, miracles these distribution of the holy spirit that kind of language right so if we're to say well hey now that we have the gospel uh, codified in the scripture. We don't need the uh, the signs and the wonders and the miracles that came with it. If a cessationist is to be consistent, they would have to do the same thing with what the author of Hebrews says about the law. So the law was given through angels. The gospel was given in accompaniment with signs and wonders and miracles. And so if we're to say the signs, wonders, and miracles they're gone now because we have the codified scripture, then we would also have to say angels are gone now because we have the codified law. Hey, we have the law of Moses. Don't need those angels anymore. That's the same kind of reasoning. But instead, what we would say properly is that the angels that, that accompanied the giving of the law, that was not just like a one-time thing. Angels continue to be given all throughout church history. In fact, in Hebrews itself, Hebrews 1.14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? So just because angels were present at the giving of the law doesn't mean angels are no more. Just because gifts and miracles were present at the giving of the gospel doesn't mean that those are not present anymore. And if you're going to be consistent, you have to say, Angels are gone, just like the gifts are gone, but you're not going to be consistent on that. So I would push back on, on that point, that it is inconsistent. Uh, Miller, Josh, I made that up like right before the show. So what That's do you think? Sticks. Right? Pretty good. Does it have any holes in it? Well, I, I think the the fact is they do this not just here. Cessationists don't do, do that here. They do that with all the gifts. They, by, by creating two categories of gifts, one that you won't find in Scripture, the sign gifts versus other gifts, um, they're inconsistent. Um, we're actually told with prophecy, everybody's to pursue this. This should be probably the most common gift in the church, according to Joel 2, Acts 2. Um, and yet with the gift of teaching, it says, hey, let not many of you become teachers. And yet they won't apply the same kind of... Uh, consistency uh, when it comes to which gifts should be gone and which ones are supernatural versus the ones that are less supernatural. That makes no sense. The fact is it's called a gift of teaching. It's supernatural. You, you can't take the supernatural nature of teaching out of the gift. Um, you can't even take the sign of it out of the gift. And I would say that the, the, what Peter displays, uh, sort of an overlap of both teaching and prophecy, uh, when he combines those three passages in Acts and teaches the gospel to the very people that crucified the Lord, I mean, he's displaying both of those gifts in that moment. Um, so which one is the supernatural one? That's good. Let's let's uh, round off those points in case people are just now diving in uh, and they want to a quick recap of those seven points. Tom Pennington said, hey, uh, this is clearly the gifts of the Spirit dying out in uh, the days of the apostles and the days that uh, whoever's writing Hebrews is writing Hebrews. These things were attested here uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, 2 through 4, but now we no longer need the supernatural gifts and miracles because the gospel message has been attested to and the apostles are now all dead. However, uh, as we've responded with a sevenfold argument, we have said there are multiple purposes for miracles, not just for attestation. The apostles are not exclusive, exclusively mentioned. This could be anyone attesting to those miracles and that message. Uh, There's more than just the 12 who were sent out by Jesus and performed miracles and people throughout the whole church that were doing those things. It's unclear what uh, the specific target of the bearing witness is targeted to. Uh, they are suggesting that it's a lock solid argument, that it's definitely the word, it's definitely the Bible, it's definitely the message. However, the Bible and the message isn't uh, exclusively mentioned here. The Bible's not mentioned at all. Uh, but maybe it was the message, but more than likely, it was actually the great salvation that it was attesting to that we are all partakers of. Next, we see that the bearing witness here in Hebrews chapter 2 is not necessarily a past tense, but a present tense of bearing witness, that those gifts are still actually happening in uh, the, the region that the book of Hebrews is circulating to. Now, there's no prohibition for the continuation of miracles. The spiritual gifts are for the common good. There's no mention of charismata in this verse. This is a different use uh, of the word gift. 
yet this is not the, the use charismata that we see in other places in Scripture. And finally, uh, point number eight that was added there on the fly uh, was that if we apply this kind of hermeneutic uh, to the gifts of the Spirit, shouldn't we also apply it to angels? And if there's no longer use for spiritual gifts, there must not be use for angels moving forward either. So I think they're good arguments. I think it's a great synopsis. You guys ready to move to the next clip? Clip number 10, yep. one of my favorite ones, a wicked generation seeks for a sign. Uh, you guys ready? Mm -hmm. you wicked, wicked charismatics. But we ought to not expect that God will be doing miraculous things, signs, and speaking directly from heaven because we have a sufficient word. Jesus rebuked even those in his own day that sought signs and wonders to validate putting their faith in Christ, saying in Matthew 16, 4, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. So what do you guys think? A wicked and adulterous generation. I, I don't like now, it. What, I don't like it. So what, what's fair? Well, I want to be fair to the cessationist scholars that are represented in the movie, and I'm thankful that they didn't do it. Um, it was the narrator. So whoever's putting this video together, uh, doing the documentary, it wasn't necessarily a scholar, but someone came alongside it and added this kind of language to kind of bolster uh, the documentary. Uh, however, uh, I don't think that's an appropriate use of those verses. And we'll dive into it here in a moment. Uh, what do you guys, uh, I'll start off with Michael Roundtree. Michael, you, you, you start us off. Oh, yeah, there are a number of directions to go. But first of all, I'll address the doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, so when uh, Scott Annual, I actually don't know how to pronounce his last name. I see you on Twitter all the time, Scott. Uh, anyway, but uh, it says, we ought not to expect that God will be doing miraculous uh, things, signs, and speaking directly from heaven because we have a sufficient word. Okay, so that comes back to the doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, what is that doctrine? That doctrine is that the scriptures give us sufficient that is they give us everything that we need for salvation and sanctification uh, that is for growing and holiness so it's not like somebody comes around with a new revelation or new teaching that applies to all christians everywhere and is binding on the conscience and that they need this in order to live a life pleasing to god or they need this in order to be saved we don't need a Ro uh, Roman Catholic magisterium to tell us how to be saved. We already have the Bible, etc. So that's the doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture. Cessationists believe that prophecy endangers that because we believe there are new revelations. But we don't believe there are new revelations that are binding on the on the conscience of all people everywhere. Uh, we don't believe that there are new revelations of books of the Bible. We don't believe that there are new revelations that, uh, again, everybody in the in the world would need in order to know how to be saved or sanctified or something like that. Um, what what we would say is uh, is that prophecy does not endanger that at all. Um, the and and instead we would say that cessationists actually endanger the authority of scripture uh, because they disobey the scripture that says eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And if the scripture was truly sufficient, and it is. A few things on that. One, we would expect the sufficient scripture to sufficiently tell us that the gifts have ceased, but no cessationist has produced a verse that clearly teaches that. And if you were to give a Bible to anybody who didn't have these sorts of categories, they would come out with the conclusion that the spiritual gifts were still for today, which is why we don't see cessationist cessationism even beginning to crop its head until the fourth century. Um, and even then, mildly um i had another argument on that but yeah let me, I'll, I'll pick up i can pick up where you left off if you'd like if you think of every verse in the bible that you get the doctrine of sufficiency from um like go tell, tell you know if you talk to a protestant and, and you say hey uh explain the doctrine of sufficiency they're going to go to places like second timothy three sixteen, right all scripture is god breathed and it's profitable that they're, they're going to go to first corinthians 4 6 not to go beyond what is written the bible is enough jude chapter one three the, the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints like it's it's over it's finished it's complete we don't need it none more uh, and then i would ask that protestant leader who, who who i share all of those sentiments i share those verses i believe in the doctrine of sufficiency i i, I affirm the authority of the scriptures i say yes and amen to that individual but then i say what was happening when those verses were being written was there prophecy taking place during the days of jude 
Yeah. Well, what was there healing and prophecy taking place during the days of Timothy? When, when Paul says, fan into flame the gift of God that was given to you through the laying out of my hands, Timothy. Hey, hey, Timothy, remember those prophetic words that were given to you? And make sure to hold fast to those because you could shipwreck your faith because there are folks who haven't done that prior and, and their life has been shipwrecked because they didn't hold fast to these words that were given. And, and, and it was in those days that the, the, the verses on the sufficiency of scripture were given. So the question would be uh, to my Protestant brothers who I share this agreement with that were, are in the cessationist side of the aisle, they would say, hey, uh, we believe that the, the scriptures are sufficient. Therefore, we need no longer to have any kind of revelatory gifts. But the question is, um, are you using those verses in a way that the original audience would have never used them? Where the original apostles who would have wrote those words would have never used them. When the apostle is, uh, Paul is writing 2 Timothy 3.16, is he saying, hey, Timothy, all prophecy, uh, there's no point for it anymore. We have a more ensure word, which is the scriptures. We know not longer need the gift of prophecy. No, actually in the same book that he says that the scriptures are sufficient and profitable to build you up and to teach you and to edify you, in that same breath, he says, hey, Timothy, Hold on to prophetic words. Hey, Timothy, fan into flame the charismata, the gift that has been given to you through the laying on of hands. So it's actually the verses that say that the scriptures are sufficient. The doctrine of sufficiency is communicated in a day when present revelation was still being given to the church. Charismatic uh, uh, visions, dreams, prophecy, tongues, healings, those kinds of miracles were still taking place. And if the doctrine of sufficiency could have been proclaimed and taught in the first century with the apostles and the gifts of the spirit could have been active alongside, then it is true that today that the scriptures can still be sufficient and the gifts can still be active. Uh, the idea that somehow the charismata undermines sufficiency uh, really takes the authorial intent of the scriptures and the original audience's hearing of those scriptures completely uh, uh, out of context. They, they, they completely reject that interpretation and impose a new interpretation on the text that I don't think is justified. Uh, yeah. Miller. Yeah, it's it, actually real, oh, real quick. Ahead. I'm going to tag that and I'll pass it off to Miller. But uh, and thank you, Josh, because that is the thought that I was looking for. So um, but I, I want to say this, that there's a misconstrual of what sufficiency of Scripture is. Uh, the way cessationists argue, they argue as though sufficiency of Scripture means that the Scripture is only sufficient after we have the biblical canon completed. But that's not the actual doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture. The Scripture was sufficient uh, was sufficient for Samuel in Samuel's day. It was sufficient for the psalmists in the psalmist's day. It was sufficient in the day of the minor prophets, and it was sufficient in the day of the first century church. Uh, the the uh, doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture is that God communicated everything we needed at each stage of redemptive history. That's what it means, and that's why... The Apostle Paul saw no contradiction between the sufficiency of Scripture in his day, even though the canon had not been completed, but the Scripture was still sufficient. And he saw no contradiction between sufficiency of Scripture on one hand, uh, and on the other hand, the continuance of the spiritual gifts. So I just wanted to put that in there, a clearer definition of the sufficiency of Scripture, that it's not just that the the, the the scriptures didn't become only sufficient for like people in you know the second and third and fourth and fifth centuries and beyond. The scriptures were always sufficient, and yet the gifts were continued to be practiced. If Paul saw no contradiction between the doctrine of sufficiency of scripture and the continuation of the gifts, neither should we. And I would say that cessationism actually endangers the sufficiency of scripture because it claims to know better than Paul did. Not good. So, I don't like it. Let me let me just try to think of how this plays out. So what will happen is when a uh, – I'll tell you a story. Um, I don't know if either of you guys were there. At the Convergence Conference in 2017, uh, I called out the name uh, Kathy. I said, you have um, a little blonde boy. I see a picture of you pushing a swing, and you're saying the words, I can't do this anymore. And you have pain in your shoulder that is uh, really, really bad that the Lord wants to take care of. So sure enough, I, I speak with the woman, Kathy, comes up to me afterwards. Um, the only person who would ever call her Kathy was her dad, who passed on. Um, secondarily, she did have a little blonde son. She brought him to the conference. I saw him. Then uh, thirdly, the bit about her shoulder and pushing a swing. Um, well, 
she has a, a daughter who's autistic and every night she has to push her on swing to get her to go to sleep. And so sleepless nights every night, shoulder is hurting because of having to push the swing every night. Um, and she literally cried out to God just prior to this conference saying, God, uh, I can't do this anymore. Well, we prayed for her. Uh, her shoulder gets healed, but not only that, her daughter after from that night on started sleeping through the night so that she didn't have to push the swing anymore. Now, uh, this, this is a great example of how the scriptures can tell you that God loves you. The scriptures can tell you that God is a healer. Uh, the scriptures can tell you, and they're sufficient to tell you all of these things. Um, but what those gifts did was they healed Kathy and they comforted Kathy in the midst of her pain and showed her very explicitly uh, uh, that God heard her prayers. Do the scriptures tell us that God hears our prayers? Yes, they absolutely do. But God also has other ways of showing those same things and encourages those things to happen um, because it, it it's a way that God steps away from uh, steps. I guess scriptures themselves come alive in those moments. You see the scriptures on display, the very things that the scriptures talk about. And so why does God not just do it all in the Bible? I don't know, but that's his prerogative. He gets to make that choice. Many people today would say, well, we don't, we don't need those prophetic words because we have the scriptures to tell us those things. Yes, I would agree with you. We have the scriptures to tell us those things. And yet God still chooses to do those things as well. Well, what's, yeah. I think what's really great about that is people will be on the comment section and they'll be like, well, you know, uh, prove it. You know, I, 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 you know, uh, 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 you know, this is your doctrine. This is your belief. You know, you, you couldn't possibly be doing those things. And it's probably wrong for Michael Miller to be doing those things. But I would also remind people that Charles Spurgeon did that. So, like, it's not just the charismatics, right, who are calling people out of an audience, giving them specific you know, uh, uh, details about their life, prayed for them, and then got miraculously recovered. By the way, we'll do that when we talk about how uh, charismatics aren't Protestant later on in the video. We'll, we'll kind of cover a whole bunch of Protestant teachers between the time of the Protestant Reformation uh, to, to Azusa, like a bunch of them, uh, and how many of them practiced the gift of prophecy and the gift of healing and were very, very Protestant. So uh, I, I want, want to remind people that as much as you might dislike Michael Miller, there are other stories that are corroborated throughout church history that reflect that one right. very, very and, well. Yeah. And I want to, because this is what I'm doing this episode, I guess, I'm going to tag what Miller was saying. Miller, I love <laughs> how practical you were making that because your, your point was, yes, the scripture is sufficient to tell us these things about God, um, but but the Bible doesn't like heal someone's physical condition, and that is an expression of God's love. It helps them actually experience the reality of scripture. And I think, you know, one of the things you're getting at, so here's the, here's the quote from Scott where he says like, hey, we no longer have God speaking directly to us from heaven because we have the sufficient word. It, the argument doesn't follow. Because when we look in the book of Acts at the kinds of things God communicates, the Bible in no way like would have or could have communicated those things. For instance, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip is told to go first to go to the desert road and then to go talk to that guy in the chariot, how was the Bible going to teach him? Was he going to be able to open the Bible and it was going to say, go to the desert road? No. He needed the Holy Spirit to speak to him these things. One's the Holy Spirit, one's the angel. Acts chapter 8. Or Acts chapter 9. How was Ananias going to know that he needed to go and pray for this guy named Paul? Could he have just like read the Bible? Like, oh, here's what I'm supposed to do. The Bible like doesn't replace the active, like the voice of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer telling him to do this and telling him to do that. The Bible, it gives us moral principles. It tells us, it teaches about God. It teaches us about doctrine, uh, but it doesn't it teach about us like, prophecy. what to do in every life situation. Acts chapter 10 and 11, Peter hears the Holy Spirit say like, go with those men. I, I mean, the Bible doesn't tell me who to go like who to welcome into my home and, and who to go with. Like, it doesn't tell me those things. Uh, Acts chapter um, 12, Peter is spoken to by an angel and given instructions. The Bible doesn't speak in those ways. Uh, in, in that kind of detail, hey, Peter, put on your sandals. <laughs> Wait, what? The Bible doesn't tell me that. Uh, Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit speaks and says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to do. Where does the Bible call individual missionaries from individual and very specific churches to 
to go on a on mission work. Like the Bible doesn't give that level of specificity, but the Spirit of God does in his ongoing revelation. The Bible is binding on the conscience for all people everywhere, but the Spirit will communicate to individuals at certain times and certain places to do certain things. That's what we see throughout the book of Acts, and that's why it doesn't follow to say, hey, now we have a sufficient word, so we don't need God to speak to us uh, directly from heaven. Does the all-sufficient word tell people where to go on mission trips? Does the all-sufficient word tell people whom to go dialogue with, whom to go pray for? The Bible doesn't tell us those things, but the Spirit repeatedly does throughout the book of Acts. And this all goes back to Acts 1-8, where, the, uh, where the, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in these lands. In all these situations, the Spirit is speaking to the church so that they can go out and preach. And he's also empowering them to do signs and wonders. And, and so all of that flows together is part of the purpose of the book of Acts. It's not to show us God's not doing the stuff anymore. It's to show us he actually is still doing the stuff and he will continue to do this stuff for as long as, uh, as Jesus is seated at the right hand of God until he returns, these things continue. That's actually the message of the book of Acts. So there's yeah. my tag, guys. Just that's good. You know, a little tag. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's those, just the small, tiny little, little, little one-liners. Tag. Yeah, that's right. We're gonna get a shot clock on those tags. <laughs> okay. Um, Matthew Matthew sixteen four is what is quoted that a wicked generation will seek for a sign. I think uh, this may be the worst use of scripture, um, and, and we've had quite a few good examples. I don't know. Maybe maybe every time I hear them read the Bible, I, I have I don't know. I, I don't want to get into. To, to smack talk this is this is gross this is a bad misrepresentation of of this verse is is jesus i'm going to read this verse to you uh, and i want you to ask yourself the question is jesus telling the charismatic movement to stop seeking signs uh, and that this is a group of hyper charismatic folks who are coming to jesus going oh lord we want a sign show us a sign uh, we want to see your power we want to see your glory we want to see the church built up we want to see the church edified we want to see sinners come to salvation like lord we, we we're, we're excited to see your power displayed in the earth like the psalmist is how long oh lord how long you know send your power lord like like in joel and it's like you know the uh, they're a byword among the nations but it's in those days where they when they rend their heart and not their garments and they and they mourn and they fast and they and they weep and in that day i'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and it's like it, it, the, the nations are going to say you know uh, uh uh you're a byword among the nations and when they repent you know like where is their god you know uh, th that's when the, the nation of israel repents and, and pleads and fasts and seeks god and in that day he pours out his spirit is it those kinds of charismatics that jesus is talking about in matthew 16 4 through i don't know 16 uh 1 through 4 and the pharisees and the sadducees came and testing him they asked him to show them a sign from heaven he answered them when it's evening, you say, uh, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, uh, it's going to be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. Uh, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky. but You cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no one will be given. Uh, but, no, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Guys, is this, is this a group of hyper charismatics? Who are looking for a sign? Is this a group of people who are earnestly desiring the gift of prophecy? Is this a group of individuals who Zay Luo, you know, lust after spiritual gifts that are that are desiring to see God's power on display, but souls coming into salvation? Is this a group of individuals where, man, they're just they're ready to see the church built up in unity and love? Miller crickets. <laughs> Miller, I, I I don't know. I I don't see that there, Josh. You have to help me on this one. <laughs> I got nothing. I... Okay. You know what, Miller? I talked for a long time. I was going to humbly yield to you, but oh, you you volleyed it back. So here I go. Well, I, here I, I go. Was sarcastic. There's a big <laughs> difference. There's a big difference between the Matthew 16 sign seekers and the Acts chapter 4 sign seekers. Acts chapter 4, there's some sign seekers too, and they're called apostles. Apostles and their friends. They say, Acts 4, 28, uh, or 29 to 30, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness as you stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So Acts, uh, sorry, Matthew 16, people ask for a sign. Acts 4, people ask for a sign. In the first case, it's condemned. In the second case, it's blessed. Why? Because in the first case, the Pharisees are demanding a sign for themselves. 
in the second case, the apostles are requesting a sign for others. So the first case where they're, de they're requesting and really demanding a sign for themselves, picture the Pharisee crossing his arms and saying, oh, well, you fed 5,000, well, which is what they do in John. Uh, you fed 5,000, well, that's not enough. Moses fed the people for 40 years, prove yourself. And so that's the, that's the language of what somebody does when they're testing God. No, uh, to, to you test mean like God, some of the, say, in the God, chat section yourself. right now? <laughs> it, right. So Matthew 16 is actually an expression of unbelief. It's like, I don't believe you. Prove yourself. Acts chapter 4 is an expression of faith, of confidence in God. They don't need the evidence. They're asking God to provide the signs, what wonders and miracles for, for others. So this comes down to motive. Charismatics, at least now I can say charismatics don't always have the best motives. Um, we can all have mixed motives, but charismatics, when they're doing it the right way, are doing it like Acts chapter four. They're asking God to pour out signs and wonders uh, for not in order for God to prove yourself to me, but in order for God to glorify his own name and uh, and to make his name great amongst the nations and in the church and and so on. And so I would say that's the chief difference. And the one, one more thing that I would say is Miller, just like you said, the arguments with cessationists routinely backfire. This is another case in point. Um, so cessationists accuse us as charismatics for violating Matthew 16 and being the sign seekers. But that's actually what cessationists do. Not all of them, but the ones who say, go and clean out a hospital, then I'll believe you. Man, you sound a whole lot like the people Jesus condemns. The hey, ones hey, that which he one? Who struck you, Jesus? Which one? Prove it. Yeah, prove it. Prove it. Hey, pro provide you know, more bread than that. You know, Moses did it for 40 years. Prove yourself, Jesus. Prove yourself charismatic. Clean out a hospital. Prove yourself. Go to the graveyard. Raise everybody from the dead. Psh. Yeah, right. That kind of mocking is actually what Jesus condemns. Correct. So if you're going to use this argument, just know, and God just does this because he has a sense of irony about him. Just know you're actually condemning yourself in this. And, and, and to be clear, if you're a cessationist out there and you're saying, oh, they're, they're not allowing us to ask for evidence. No, we're, we're not doing that. We, we, we would appeal to evidence. We've got two volumes by, by Dr. Craig Keener uh, called Miracles that we would encourage you to check out. Uh, the, the documentary Sin Proof, the, the evidence is given by Jack Deere and others. We, we have testimonies. We have experiences. We, if, if you're looking for that stuff, come with us as, to a conference. We, we will we'll have you stand next to us as we pray for folk and people get healed. Like we, we, We're not saying you can't want evidence or or ask if there's evidence but what i find to be the case is they will start with the bible i will say that's not what the bible says and then they say well then why don't you prove it doing the stuff and then i'll say well then come and look at these things that we're going to show you and then they say no those are all fake and fabricated so it's like uh, uh, no i'm not going to listen to you oh i'm not going to see it like they're intentionally having a hard heart to resist what the word of God says, then they're going to throw up hurdles in front of it to prevent them from to being exposed to real demonstrations of power. So it's like, it's, it's, it's like saying, man, I don't believe in trains. Well, have you ever gone to a train station? No, I'm, I'm a train denier. Well, you should go. I know where a train station is. Well, I refuse to go there. Well, 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 I've got all these books and, and documents about trains and how they've existed throughout history. Nope. I refuse to read them because I don't believe they exist. Like what? Well, you're, you're creating a level of evidence that's so high. You represent Pharisees. Like, at least we're reading Middleton. We're reading B.B. Warfield. We're, we're reading John Calvin. We read your arguments. We watch your videos. We respond to your content. Please, likewise, do the same. Return the favor. Look at the content we're recommending. Watch the videos. Watch the documentaries. Read the books. There is evidence out there. Um, and, and again, you know, they argue, oh, why don't you heal, uh, you know, clear out a hospital? You know, you've got, you should be able to do this on the command. We have addressed this at nauseum. Guys, the gifts of the Spirit aren't done on command. The Apostle Paul couldn't do gifts on command. Jesus, there was a Spirit present to heal. Uh, uh, Jesus could not do many miracles there. Uh, uh, Paul left Trophimus and Miletus sick, right? Epaphroditus was on his deathbed before God raised him up. Timothy had to take some wine for his stomach. And yet at the end of Paul's life, he heals the whole flipping island of Malta. So, so you can't just tell me, okay, well, the gifts are dying off, or, 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 or if you can't be doing them on command, then they're not real gifts. Th these are just, again, hurdles to throw up. And, and again, it's it seems to be the kind of approach of the cessationist documentary that we're watching. If they just throw oh. out enough content, if they just throw up enough arguments and enough uh, uh, different voices saying this about the Bible and this about history and this about uh, common experience, then maybe the audience will just not be smart enough to dig into those things. Uh, and, and it's 
I think it's upsetting. I, I think that they, they're insulting their audience, they're insulting their viewers to not dig a little bit deeper because none of these arguments hold not water. Not one of these Bible verses that we've dug into once is being used appropriately. The history that's about to be cited is disgusting. Uh, and I would encourage you, you know, cessationist guys, I, I've made this appeal, I think in every video, if you're out there, um, uh, the guys who made this documentary, open invitation. Come, we'll, we'll fly you down, we'll sit down, we'll film. If you wanna promote your content, that's a great way to do it. Sit down and discuss with us uh, because it's it's frustrating. Uh, what, what you're doing, you're not representing our side at all and you're misrepresenting the scriptures to prove an agenda and a tradition that nullifies the word of God. Um, and I, I don't know, I stand by it. So I see Justin Peters in the chat saying, I just stumbled onto this. Cessationists aren't mocking when they tell people like Todd White to go clear a hospital. Hold on a second. Uh, you may not be mocking, but we have evidence in our chat section of plenty of cessationists doing exactly that, saying, prove it to me. Show, go to a hospital, clear it out. It's like, hold on a second. Um, here's the thing. Even if we were to do that, it still wouldn't provide enough evidence. You'd still go, well, I believe God heals. Wait, okay, so in response to prayer, God healing, you're still going to disqualify no matter what evidence is produced because you just keep moving the bar so that it fits your narrative. But then secondarily, yeah. let's say even if we did provide the evidence, which we have, uh, send proof, go watch the movie, uh, go read Jack Deere's book, or uh, go read Craig, Craig Keener's. Craig Keener's miracles, you work on miracles is the best on yeah. miracle proof. Right. It's right there. It's all there. But here's what you're going to say. Well, you guys are just building your theology off of experience. It's like th there's no way you can – you've built a system – that there's nothing that can be done to show otherwise because you just keep moving the bar. Does that make sense? Like it's real yeah, easy I, to I win would something. Say you just keep moving the, the goalpost further and further. Yeah. I mean, I would say cessationism builds its argument off of experience because it says, well, prove it, then I'll believe. I'm not saying all cessationists are the same, not all say that. But when they say that, they're actually basing it on their experience of not ex not knowing anything uh, or not, not knowing as in experientially anything regarding to the gifts and, and uh, the so-called sign gifts. So I would say that's basing it off of experience. And, and I would say, I mean, Miller, I know for you and me, we were convinced by the scripture before we ever had an experience. I would say our experience followed the scripture. Um, but I wouldn't have a problem with somebody having an amazing experience of God healing them or, uh, you know, or an amazing prophetic word and then investigating the scripture and coming to that conclusion. I think that it can go both ways. Uh, you know, the apostle Paul, uh, had an incredible experience on the road to Damascus caused him to rethink a few things. So uh, let me <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Let ahead. me jump in got, here too. I got a little passionate there. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty passionate. And, and here Justin's like, Hey, like have Todd White clean out a hospital. Here, here's the thing. If you have an individual claiming that the gift of healing works on command, I think you should be able to tell that person to go to go clean, right. clean out a hospital, right? Because they are they're setting the bar of evidence to say I should be able to do this 100% of the time. And you're just like, okay, well then go and do it. But again, the vast majority of the charismatic movement is not that. We do have some very loud outliers on the outside of the charism uh, the outside of the charismatic movement, and certainly hyper charismatic com community that you and I can actually lock arms with, Justin, and say that's wrong. That's you know, oh, you, you know, Justin, you know, you're not healed today, and you're sick today because of some sin of yourself or the sin of your parents. That's disgusting. Justin, I hate it. I hate it for you. I hate it. The charismatic teachers have said that to people like you and others. My dad's got cochlear implants, you know, like, like he, he's, he's, uh, you know, legally deaf in both ears without his, uh, you know, cochlears. So, so I, I understand that that kind of doctrine, that kind of teaching from the charismatic community, uh, is, erroneously bad in the same way that there are groups of cessationists who say to be a continuationist is not Protestant or, or that there are groups of cessationists who will say, you know, uh, people who are charismatic aren't even Christian brothers. Like, like there are extreme cessationists and I'm not, I don't believe that that's representative of all cessationism and there are extreme hyper charismatics, but they're also not the representation of all charismatics. We actually think that there is a healthy mi uh, middle ground biblical way that the gifts of the spirit operate that we see in the days of the Bible. Um, so anyway, I, I've rambled long enough, guys. Do you guys ready to move to the next clip or do y'all have anything you want to add uh, yeah. to that wicked and perverse generation that seeks for a sign? No, I think we're good. Let's go to the next clip. Sweet. The Bible does not instruct us to seek after signs and wonders. Instead, we are told to stop seeking those things and to trust in the finished word. The early church fathers knew that they were not apostles. They knew that there was something distinct about the apostles and distinct about the apostolic age. 
And so when you get to, for example, John Chrysostom in the East and Augustine around that same time period in the West, both Chrysostom and Augustine are very clear that they believe that the extraordinary miraculous sign gifts ceased after the end of the apostolic age. And that was the de facto view of Bible-believing Christians throughout really all of subsequent church history, including the Reformation. I just want to see how long we can stay silent on Michael Miller before he realizes that the camera's on him. <laughs> I, I had a feeling it might have been, but I was trying to respond to a, another chat section. <laughs> Michael Rodgers, same story. Guys, this, okay, this the phrase, false. we are told, again, by the narrator, it, it seems like the narrator seems no to make text. overstatements in ways that a lot of the scholars aren't. Uh, like in the last video, uh, the narrator makes the phrase, uh, uh, oh yeah, that a wicked generation seeks for a sign. And this one, uh, he's saying that we're told to stop seeking those things. What Bible verse is he talking about? We would what? love that Bible what, verse. If what portion of the scripture verse, say, please stop I, seeking? I forbid, I start forbidding speaking in tongues. It's coming from the Book of Mormon? I, I don't know where you find that. It's the I'm Book of Third curious. Hesitation, no. man. It's not even in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say this, challenge to the cessationists. If you can find that verse for me in the Bible, I will become a cessationist because I just want to obey the Bible. The Bible I read says eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially get to prophecy. Uh, the one you're reading says stop seeking those things. So could you show me, because I can show you where it says to seek those things. Could you show me where it says to stop seeking those things? The truth is you can't. You can't. You made that up. That's not true. So that's what I would say. But he also says more and he touch, touches on Church history. Which which one of you guys wants to jump on the church history piece? Oh gosh. Okay, let's do it. So, Michael, was you, were you raising your head or hand or just rubbing your head? I couldn't tell what you were doing. Oh, um, I, this is where I need quotes. So we're gonna have to. I'm just trying to get to the right place in the notes. Yeah, pull up quotes here. I'll, I'll highlight it for you, bud. And you can. Yeah, you know, the four uh, sure, sure. before 400 AD and then after 400 AD. So I'll, I'll get you prepped up on that. So on this quote uh, that the early church fathers. Uh, knew that they were not apostles. They knew that something dis was distinct about the apostolic age. And, and so when you get to example, John Christostom in the East and Augustine at the same time period in the West, they're very clear. They do not believe in supernatural sign gifts. Okay, so I have a copy sitting in this office somewhere and I'm gonna have to find it. Uh, book 22 of the City of God. Uh, it's a big, thick book. Um, uh, in in book 22 of, of uh, the City of God, which for us is one book, but the chapters basically um, in the city of God, he goes after all of the miracles that he sees healings. Uh, Augustine is like the worst use of church history because he starts as a cessationist, but then he read the Bible and experienced. If some you're trying to prove cessation and became a continuationist. So if you're trying to prove cessationism, don't quote the one guy who became a continuationist. Like it doesn't even make sense. And here's the thing. This is an echo chamber and it proves that it's an echo chamber or it's a lie. One or the other. John MacArthur has been saying that Augustine was a cessationist since Strange Fire. Since the book came out and the conference came out, he's been saying that. But do you know how many charismatic scholars with loud symbols and trumpets have been saying, no, he's not. He's one of us. And we've been yelling it and no one has engaged with it. They're ignoring it or they don't ever hear it because they're not interested in engaging with it. Guys, this is the worst use of uh, 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 of history to say to say that up into the point of 400 again we're getting various times oh it died out with the apostles oh it died out 100 AD oh by the, by the year 400 it, you know virtually the whole world of cessationists and all the way to the Protestant Reformation that is like the most disgusting representation of history you're either mega mega ignorant or you're lying and and I don't know which one's worse when you're making these kinds of claims uh, okay one of you guys want to start getting off with quotes. Sure. Yeah. It's just well, disingenuous. Oh, but it wait, is wait, interesting Michael, though that in. he start. Go ahead, Noah. Go ahead. I've talked a lot. <laughs> okay, we'll start it with Justin Martyr. This is AD. Uh, he was 8100, 8155. He says this: For the prophetical gifts remain with us even to this present time, and hence you ought to understand that the gifts formerly among your nation have been transferred to us. And just as were the false prophets contemporaneous with your holy prophets, so are there now many false teachers among us, of whom our Lord forewarned us to beware. 
Therefore, we are most anxious that you be persuaded not to be misled by such persons, since we know that everyone who can speak the truth and yet speaks it not shall be judged by God. It accordingly said, he ascended on high, he led captive, he gave gifts to sons of men, and again, in other prophecies that said, and it shall come to pass after this, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and my servants and on my handmaids, and they shall prophesy. Now it is possible to see amongst us women and men possess gifts, presumably including prophecy and the spirit of God. This is interesting because one of the timelines they actually give is uh, AD 100. Well, actually throughout this documentary, they give several different timelines. They're very inconsistent in that actual thing. But here you have uh, Justin Martyr using the exact same text that we use. He quotes from Ephesians 4. He quotes from Joel 2 and Acts chapter 2. And these actually are the continuationist gifts that explicitly talk about these things being around. That, that the, new, the new covenant uh, mention of Joel 2, it's actually telling us what new covenant experience should look like. That, that prophecy is now normal. The whole church of God has the spirit of God, which looks like the power of God demonstrated through prophecy as one of the main examples. Um, and yeah. then Ephesians 4, it also talks about the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry until we attain the unity of faith and the measure of full ma uh, mature nature of the Lord himself. So this is a, a passage about, and, and this is the gifts that are mentioned in Ephesians 4, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But the apostle prophet are in there, and Justin Martyr is, is right here saying, hey, these gifts are still around. Matter of fact, we have people that we can show you. But, you know, again, it's like, People, the cessationists of Justin Martyr's day are going to probably be like, well, we don't want to build our theology off of experience. Don't show us right. the actual proof. Anyway, sorry. Right. I'm, so I'm being... I, I think it's fascinating, though, that the first cessationists that appear in church history uh, are in the fourth century, John Chrysostom and Augustine. One of them, Augustine, changes his mind. The other one, John Chrysostom, a fabulous preacher, an incredible man of God, uh, but he also lived in a really dark time. I did, I did a sermon on like uh, on communion a while back, and uh, I remember in just some of my study, I found John Chrysostom saying, like, I can't even find anybody to partake in the altar. So John Chrysostom lived in a dark uh, in a dark time, and as it, as the empire was starting to change, and uh, and the whole world was becoming Christian because it was cool to be Christian, and uh, the clergy started to sort of take uh, more of the responsibility for themselves and the laity less. And I, I mean, it was just a, a time. Yes, the the gifts definitely did become less after the fourth century. But as we read on a recent episode, D. A. Carson says it's uh, it's fruitless to try to prove that the gifts died out at any point in church history because we have enough evidence all throughout church history to show that there was always something going on. Uh, but it's interesting that they selectively choose two guys in the fourth century uh, when we have lots of and ignore of people. Yeah, they ignore before and after, but there was loads and loads, of, like the spirit was was doing loads of miracles before the fourth century. They completely overlook. Here's Irenaeus um, says in uh, writing in the second century, in like manner, do we also bear many brethren in the church who possess prophetic gifts and through the spirit speak all kinds of languages Yes, moreover, as I have said, the dead even are being raised, uh, have been raised up and remained among us for many years. So it uh, gives this incontrovertible proof like, hey, yes, not just resurrection, but like they're still with us. Like, <laughs> go have a conversation with them if you want. Uh, and I think it's fascinating that the gift of tongues is in there. Also, as a former cessationist myself, I know that tongues is probably the scariest of them all uh, because it's so weird. But here we have evidence of tongues and uh, and throughout church history. There is evidence of tongues all the way through, in, uh, including uh, up through like, I mean, Great Awakenings, Jonathan Edwards. I mean, you had the Moravians uh, uh, in, in the 1500s talking about tongues. And so, but all the way through Middle Ages, uh, Sam Storms talks about this in his book, The Language of Heaven. So uh, anyway, uh, Josh, you want to read from Tertullian? Oh, sure. we got to go uh, Irenaeus and then Tertullian. Yeah. Yeah, so here, uh, these quotes, right. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, we've actually quoted them in a prior episode. So I'll quote Tertullian. Uh, we've got quotes, quotes from Novation uh, in, in 210 uh, to, to 280 and Origen from, you know, uh, uh, 185 to 254. But then I want to get into, because his claim was that after Augustine and, and moving forward, there are no continuationist out there. And that's just not true. Uh, this quote from Tertullian, it says, for seeing that we too acknowledge that the spiritual uh, charismata or gifts, we too have merited the 
uh, attainment of the prophetical gifts. Uh, and heaven knows how many distinguished men, to say nothing of the common people, have been cured uh, of, of either devils or of their sicknesses. Again, so this is Tertullian. And again, we're not bringing up church history because history proves our doctrine, but you brought history into this argument and we're just responding, your history is wrong. Um, Augustine, uh, this is AD uh, uh, 354 to, to 430, uh, in his work, City of God, book 22, Augustine describes numerous miracles of healings and even resurrections from the dead. I am so pressed, he says, by the promise of the finished work that I cannot record all of the miracles I know. So many miracles, he says. Uh, he also continues, he says, for I myself, when I was writing this very book, knew a blind man who had been given uh, his sight in this uh, the same city near the bodies of the martyrs of Milan. Uh, I knew of some other uh, miracles as well, so many that have occurred even uh, these times uh, that we would be unable to either uh, to be aware of all of them or to number them in which... Uh, and to number those of which we are in awe. So again, so this is Augustine. We've got stories from uh, Gregory the Great, recorded miracles of St. Benedict from uh, 540 to 604. We've got stories from Bernard of Clairvaux and his writings of uh, Malachi uh, O'Morgan. Uh, we've got uh, re uh, re recordings of uh, Bonaventure. Um, we've got John uh, of Egypt. We have Leo the Great. We have Geneva of Paris. We have Benedict of Nazianzus. We have Gregory the Great. We have Gregory uh, uh, Taurus. We have the Venerable Bay. We have uh, Cutbird. We have, uh, I mean, I can't even pronounce half of these names. Uh, Bonaventure, Francis of Assisi, Thomas Aquinas. We have Peter uh, uh, Waldo, founder uh, of the Waldenians. We have um, Jeez Louise, these names are impossible to write. Hildegard, we, we, I have 26 Hildegard, names uh, period, from the period of 300 of to 1419. I, I don't even know. I don't even know what you're looking for, man. When you're saying church history is just, you know, the de facto position of church history is just just cessationist, basically from Augustine to to uh, you know uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation. And I have 26 names of reputable, uh, recognizable names of church fathers, influential people in the Christian Church uh, from the year 394 to the year 1419. In every period of church history, there has been charismata. And if you read these quotes, we'll read a few of them. I'll let Michael Michael read some quotes here. If you read some of these quotes, uh, the miracles that are being performed are dead raising. Uh, a, a const, uh, individuals seeming to have been endowed with a gift of healing that they frequently see healings, not on demand, not all the time, but like Jesus and the apostles, frequently seeing healing. Uh, the, the prophetical gifts frequently predicting outcomes of certain events over and over and over in church history. And this is not even including the stuff that happens with Protestants after the Protestant Reformation that the cessationists try to gloss over as if it didn't happen, which we'll do at a later time. Uh, when do you guys want to quote some of these other uh, church fathers and some I of their mean, there are wild so miracles? Many. It's, overwhelming. it's overwhelming. Which period do you want to go to? After Augustine or? Yeah, give me after Augustine. Reformation. Okay. Yeah. Benedict heals lepers. Okay. But I must not here pass over with silence that which I had by relation of the honorable man, Anthony, who said that his father's boy was so pitifully punished with a leprosy that all his hair fell off, his body swelled, and filthy corruption did openly come forth, who being sent by his father to the man of God, he was by him quickly restored to his former health. Okay, so we, we have the, the John MacArthur qualification of it has to be a fast fast miracle like it can't be, it to be fast it, it, it can't be like the lepers in jesus's day where he prayed for them and they were healed on their way yeah. it has to be a quick yeah, miracle that's... like this one yeah that's right so <laughs> uh man there there are so many it's overwhelming um maybe read I'll, just I'll... the the headers and then yeah. and then if you, you want if you want the study notes we have a now 27 page document going through the cessations documentary with citations and quotes and scriptures and scholars and history all referenced in there if you want it just sign up for the newsletter in the description of this video you can get the whole thing once we're done with this this yeah. series I, I think let what if we just what if we move on to quote uh clip number 12 and finish with that because i mean just suffice it to say we have like a gazillion miracles listed in here performed by saints in a way that looks more like sign gifts as the cessationists would call it than just like a rando miracle happening after prayer um multiple lots dead and raisings, lots of multiple but josh if you want to if you want to read them we can read them but i don't know i kind of think 
We can just talk about the Montanus con- head con- notes, right? Like casting out of demons, uh, 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 people who are paralytic getting healed, bad livers getting healed, lame people getting healed, the dead being raised multiple times, people predicting deaths, people uh, predicting uh, plagues that are coming on on the earth and how to avoid them uh, over and over and over. I mean, tons and tons and tons of these. And it doesn't seem like in some of these occurrences that they were infrequent, that these individuals had these gifts frequently. I'm happy to move on if you guys are good to move on. Yeah. 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 Cool. Clip number 12. The view of the church has been decidedly cessationist. Then you had a group of continuationists, especially evangelical continuationists, who have tried to find examples of miraculous gifts throughout church history. But the reality is, in order to find evidence of the miraculous gifts throughout church history, the modern continuationist has to redefine what those gifts are, what those gifts were. They generally do so by pointing to fringe movements and fringe groups, like the Montanist movement, which was declared a heresy by the early church. Now, in the case of the Montanists, they make claims that they are actually the fulfillment of Christ's promise of the Comforter, of the Holy Spirit. They are the ones who are bringing new revelation to the church, as well as declaring that that Christ was coming very soon, uh, even right after their lifetimes were. Be- uh, after their lifetime, let me make sure I got that whole quote in there. Uh, throughout history, uh, but the reality is, in order to find evidence of miraculous gifts throughout church history, uh, the modern continuation has, has to redefine the gifts, what they are. Um, yeah, that was the first quote. Uh, that quote, oh, that, there it is. Um, even after their lifetimes or before the end of their lives that don't come to pass. He's talking about the uh, specific charismatic gifts or prophecies that don't come to pass under the Montanists. Guys, are you ready to tackle this? I know I chatted quite a bit for that last one. Gosh, to try to do this in 10 minutes is going to be rough. But uh, th- what I what's frustrating here is he says they have to redefine the gifts. Hold on a second. I don't think we're the ones redefining gifts. I think they're isogeting their own definitions of those gifts into the text and thereby redefining them. Um, so let's just take the first example of gift of healing. What do you call it when God heals somebody? You call it a healing. Call it healing. No, uh, no but a no, cessationist calls that a miracle, Michael. That's not a healing because oh, the gift of healing, right. when someone gets healed, that's not the gift of healing. That's a miracle. It looks like a duck. It quacks like a duck, but that, that is actually a goose. So when God speaks to somebody to give them something to say to someone else, uh, what is is that not prophecy? What do you call no, that? No, I don't, I don't get it. It's not. That is what we call providential leading or impressions, as Tom Schreiner likes to say. That's not prophecy. That's a that's an impression that uh, the Lord is leading you to do, right? Oh, so but the funny thing is, can't be like, categorized as prophecy, oh, right? Like right. Acts twenty one four is where Shriner says that it's a it's an impression, it's not prophecy. But even if you're going to use the word impression, it's still God speaking to you. Acts twenty one four, there, like what he's trying to avoid is like God spoke to somebody and that it was wrong. And hey, I'm on board for that we don't want to think that way. God doesn't speak in a way that's erroneous. But the way we get around it, not get around it, I'll I'll say it more like this, the way we explain Acts 21.4 is that God gave an accurate revelation, he gave an accurate revelation, and then people prophesied the wrong thing. He would say, well, they they just had an impression and misinterpreted it. It's it's like we're just using different vocabulary, but to your point, prophets, they made up the word impression because they didn't like the word prophecy. They're, they're, the ones getting, they're the ones getting around it. They're redefining the gifts and baking them into it. So uh, when it says that the perfect comes, or let's just take that as an example, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12, who's redefining what the perfect is? Um, well, many, not all, some don't, would say that the appearing of Jesus is the perfect. That's what charismatics would say. Whereas some cessationists would say, no, most no, no, that's do. that's the completion of the scriptures. Right, most scholars agree. Um, and then what is the foundation of Ephesians 2.20? What, what is I that? I mean, a cessationist gosh? says it's the Bible. Track. Even though that verse has nothing to do with the Bible, it doesn't say the Bible, it doesn't say scripture. The ah, cessationists right. go, Ephesians 2.20 is the Bible. Hmm, that's interesting. So it's not the revelation of the Gentile inclusion, like that they're now coming in. This thing that's been long awaited, been prophesied for several millennia, uh, and now it's actually come to pass, this this thing that the rest of the world couldn't foresee coming, but it happened. That's not what it is, right, in Ephesians 2.20? 
I, I mean, that's it. I mean, as, as we walk through these arguments, it's the cessationists that are going to invent things. Like there are only three periods of miracles in which there are events that are taking place. They're going to invent things like, well, you know, the gifts of the spirit were dying down, even though that we see uh, in the book of Acts, Paul at the end of his ministry before he gets locked up, heals an entire island of people. The argumentation from the cessationists are the ones who are inventing categories. They're inventing doctrines. They're inventing, you know, uh, demands on the gift of healing. When Jesus couldn't heal on command all the time, the gift, the spirit was present to heal in that moment or, or, or because of their unbelief was unable, but, but to perform a few miracles in that place, right? Like the apostles, they, they were healing, but they couldn't heal all the time. It seems like there was moments where they could heal and moments when they couldn't because God's sovereignty is involved. God's power is necessary that the apostles are praying, Lord, would you stretch forth your hand and perform signs, wonders, and miracles through your, your servants, the apostles, like, would you do this through us? They're asking because they can't do it on command. So, so again, it's, the cessationist who is inventing categories on the gifts. They're inventing categories that invent doctrines of cessationism that cannot be found in scripture. They have to invent them and then read them onto the text. Um, and, and again, it's not the continuationist who are inventing these things. It is the cessationist who is inventing these things. Um, yeah. And of course they invent the special category of sign gift, the gifts, the bucket of gifts that we don't like, and therefore we're going to take out of the picture. Now, of course they would never word it that way. Uh, but tongues, healing, uh, pro uh, prophecy, and uh, miracles, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, interpretation of tongues, like these gifts, these are the sign gifts. What verse of scripture uses the language sign gifts? None. Which verse of scripture groups these together in a special category that's different from the other category? None. So you've just made these a label called sign gifts. So if we're going to talk about inventing things, I'm going to go with the label sign gift is an invention of cessationist cessationism because they don't want sign gifts today. I mean, they don't believe in them, uh, but they use an, an invented language to, uh, to import their doctrine. So, uh, I would say it's once again, it's the cessationists who are guilty of what they charge. Nathan here makes a statement about generally, right? Um, they, 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 they do so, they try to justify it by pointing to fringe movements and fringe groups like the Montanist movement, uh, uh, which was declared to be her a heresy in the early church. Do we all agree that the Montanist movement was declared heresy in the early church? We all agree that it was declared heresy in the early church. That I want to know which evangelical leader- bizarre examples. I want to know which evangelical leader you're, you're, you're using that says, hey, the Montanists were good guys, not bad guys, and we're going to model our ministry off of the Montanists. Now, there is certainly debates in history right now, or history in, in, in the theology space right now, on whether the Montanists actually believed the things that they were accused of believing since Tertullian, a well-known and reputable church father who defended the doctrine of the Trinity with every tooth and, and fiber of his being, being, who was a continuationist, did get involved in the Montanist movement and, in fact, defended the Montanist movement. So there's debates on uh, did the Montanists ac actually do the things the individuals are saying they did? Uh, were there groups of Montanists who were worthy of those kinds of condemnations, but not all yeah. of the Montanists were representative yeah, it, of that? It, it, There's a lot of debate on whether those things are actually happening uh, in history. However, however, were the Montanists considered heretics because of the spiritual gifts? If watching this documentary, watching that clip I just showed you, you would be led to believe that the early church believed the Montanists were heretics on the grounds of spiritual gifts alone. That's what and you'd this be led is to dishonest. believe. It is this dishonest. Is dishonest. The, the fact that they're putting the Montanists up as the example that all charismatics follow, but they don't give you one charismatic then, that says, ah, the Montanists, they're the example we follow. Uh, oh, and then they play them, they, they, they show that the Montanists are called heretics, which leaves one to believe, what should we think about charismatics today? Well, the example they have is the Montanist. It's, it's yeah. dishonest. Well, and to Josh's point, it is debated, and I'm sure it's like most things, like uh, the most in most situations when you have a group, it's usually not a monolith. The Montanist, was it the same across the board? Uh, Hippolytus, uh, a renowned church father, affirmed the botanists, uh, the heresy, uh, the heresy hunter, famous heresy hunter in uh, in the fourth century, Epiphanius conceded the, that the Montanists agreed with the church 
on matters of orthodoxy, including the Trinity. And so some of the claims made about Montanists might not be true or might only be true of some of them, but neither here nor there. The claim that Nathan makes is that charismatics our only appeal to church history is fringe movements like the Montanists. And what I want to say is there, there is so much evidence. I mean, if we were to just read it straight, it would take days and days to read through all the documented history of miracles and revelations and quote unquote sign gifts being exhibited all throughout church history. I don't need the Montanists. If the Montanists never existed, then I would have tons and tons of evidence throughout church history that this stuff happened. And yet he wants to say, well, the Charismatics, they look to the Montanists and fringe movements like that uh, because they have nowhere else to look to uh, in church history. And I'm, I'm going, no, no, actually, I've read church history and it gives me the impression you never have. That's right. And let's, let's look at some of these, you know, some of the things that the Montanists were accused of believing. Again, I'm not saying that they believe or taught these things. I'm just saying that this is what they were being accused of believing. Uh, the Montanists uh, were, could have been believed as heretics because uh, their leader declared that he was the Holy Spirit incarnate. Also, if that is a true statement, if that actually happened, that's heresy. Every charismatic I know would completely repudiate that and say that's a damnable heresy. You should not claim to be God, especially not the third person of the Trinity. Uh, Montanus teacher was accused of being a Gnostic. Okay, the Gnostics had secret books, secret knowledge, additional things that they were adding to the canonization of Scripture. They denied the wrath of God in the Old Testament, this big mean evil God, and that we were all gods and we had to ascend to become gods. If the Montanus movement is Gnosticism. It should be repudiated and and, and completely called heretical. Uh, also, uh, uh, the uh, the Montanist. Many of them were accused of being uh, uh, monarchialist, or it's it's kind of a fancy kind of modalism. Okay, uh, it is absolutely heresy. If they denied that Trinitarian heresy, it would be false. Also. Uh, the, uh, the, the Montanist rejected bishops' authority and empowered women to preach and teach, which the church at that time would have considered universally flatlined heresy to reject the bishops and to empower women to practice and participate in the leadership of the local church. So my question would be, if you're watching this documentary, are you hearing there's this group of individuals that are heretics on grounds of Christology and Orthodox ecclesiology within the local community, or are you hearing that these are groups are, are heretics because they believe in spiritual gifts? And, and, and here's the thing, the guys who are considered Orthodox who lived around this time period that we just touched on, such as Tertullian, are not considered heretics. The guys that we mentioned earlier, Augustine, uh, 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 Justin Martyr, uh, uh, Novation, all of these guys who would have been living around this time period, right? They believed in spiritual gifts and they're not called heretics. Why is that? Well, we, we want to make the charismatic movement uh, uh, parallel to some kind of malign group in church history, not not the normative church fathers throughout the history who defended orthodoxy, who proclaimed the doctrine of, of the Trinity, who, who, who believed in a, doctor, do, a doctrine of justification by grace through faith. We're not talking about those those charismatics. We want to malign the charismatic movement with the with the Montanists and all the accusations of false doctrine and heresy that they believed. It's disingenuous and it's wrong. Uh, the vast majority of church history that I've been aware of, that, that I have read, is continuationist and does not condemn uh, the, the practicing of spiritual gifts. Yeah. I know my, my co-hosts have got to get out of here and I'm, I'm long-winded. One of you guys want to pick up on, on that thought? Uh, well, cessationism is a novel doctrine. It's new. Uh, the earliest appearance is in the fourth century uh, and it was never dominant until after the Protestant Reformation. And, uh, and, even, and then, even then they were divided. Yeah. Even then they were, they were divided all over it. And, uh, you know, we've done episodes on the Presbyterian prophets and so on. And I would also say this, even for cessationism, there, there is some nuance. Not everybody is so hardline cessationist that they would never allow for any kind of revelation, any kind of prophecy, uh, and so on. Uh, if you read the reformers who were even cessationists, they seem to allow a little bit of wiggle room for some expression of those. So just as I said, there are not... Uh, it, usually a group, there's not a monolith. We don't want to be associated with every continuationist belief out there. Um, you know, we don't, we don't be, as, and the same way there's a, 
there's a breadth in cessationism too. So I do want to be charitable on that. Well, well, here's here's something I don't want to be charitable on. Here, here's a quote from Justin Peters. Upside down, literally everything I have uh, seen you say is 100% false. You're simply lying. Okay, guys, 100% false. Open up Google right now and Google this quote from Augustine and see if I'm 100% Just lying. Really, really quick, Josh, he's, is he talking to us or is he talking to someone in the chat? I really, he's really hope it's someone in the chat. It, it is. It is. I looked at the. I looked at the comment. Upside is somebody on the chat section. Okay, <laughs> Justin. <laughs> I'm sorry for getting frustrated there. I, I thought you were accusing of 100% of what I was saying is lying. And I'm like, no, guys, just Google just, it. I, here's, okay. here's the, let me say something here. Because, Justin, you, you're sitting here watching this show. I've, we've invited you to come on the show. You keep representing charismatics by mentioning guys like Andrew Walmack, Chris Vallotton, uh, Todd White. But you're not actually debating charismatics. You're calling those guys out. And, and so what that does for the rest of us, it makes us go, look, man, you're falsely representing charismatics. You're pointing out the guys that we also disagree with. Come on the show and have a real conversation with us. And stop pointing to those guys as the example, as though they somehow represent us, which is what you're doing, which is disingenuous. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say disingenuous instead of dishonest. But, but those two lines get really blurry here because the fact is they don't represent us. And I'm tired of you pointing out them and not actually having a conversation with us. Yeah, and Fair. and I apologize. Thank you guys for keeping me like from from like bearing false witness from misunderstanding a text thread that was directed at someone else. I wouldn't want to put words in someone else's mouth. I'm like, guys, I did the research. I read the source material. Uh, I I compiled 27 pages of of work, and I was like, 100 no. percent false. That's wild. Okay. The offer still stands, Justin. Come on. I know that y'all had a round table, table with it, Sam Storms. It doesn't have to be a debate. Dr. Michael Brown, Schreiner. I'd love to see that as well. It doesn't have to be a debate. We had Shriner on, and he just talked about cessationism. And one, one thing I loved about Shriner is he said, please push back. I want you to push back. You guys can go watch our videos with him on cessationism. And that's what I would love to see between cessationists and continuationists is like, okay, let's have a conversation. Let's have some honest pushback. But it wasn't a debate with Shriner. Go back and watch it. And yeah, Justin, we welcomed you to come on the show. We wouldn't, it, it would just, we, we get pushed back as you would expect, but we, it, it would be just a conversation. I think it'd be fruitful to the body of Christ. We'd love for you to come on. Cool. Let's sign off guys. Um, yep. We need to wrap things up. Any closing thoughts from you? Uh, no, not, not really. I think I pretty much said what I want to say. Miller? Miller? Ah, no, I'm good. Okay. Got fiery. Guys. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Render Radio. If you want to support the channel, there are links in the description to do so. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or Patreon. If you want to get extra content, you can subscribe there on Patreon uh, and get access to a little bit of extra content. But if you're out there and you want to see our document that we've got uh, re responding to the cessationist documentary that's two hours and 20 minutes, I think, uh, all of the clips that we have been sharing have been documented in one single doc, and we're going to respond to uh, all of the claims that are made in this film very, very carefully. So if you're interested in those notes, you want to preach them, you want to teach them, you want to go through them, you want to read them, you want to research them yourself, uh, subscribe to the mailing list, the newsletter, and when we're done with our series on cessationism, we'll be sending it out to everyone. We might even send out some, some early copies, depending on how long this series goes. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode, and we'll see you next week at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time as we pick up our next episode on cessationism, uh, or you can tune in on Monday at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time for our weekly interviews. See you guys then.